Hello and welcome to today's Industry Week webcast, Root Cause Analysis Tools and How to Use Them, sponsored by Kepner Trigo. My name is Steve Minner. I'm the Executive Editor with Industry Week. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you're having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the Maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the question window on the left-hand side of your screen and then hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Industry Week websites within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your console, the Kepner Trigo logo is hotlinked, so if you want to visit their website during this webcast, you can click on a logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the webinar. I'd now like to introduce our presenter. Michael Curran Hayes is the global practice leader in Kepner Trigo's operational excellence and service excellence efforts in the Americas. Michael provides executive leadership for a range of consulting and training services in these regions, including client-specific integrated teams of KT professionals. His expertise is in process, business process improvement, operational improvement, and strategy formulations. Clients he has worked with include Siemens, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Novartis, and Bristol-Myers Squibb as well as various government regulatory agencies, including the FDA and USDA. And with that, Michael, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I appreciate everybody attending about an hour, taking an hour out of your time today. Um, I'm going to be going over the root cause analysis tools. Uh, it should be something that everybody finds interesting because it's something that I'm fascinated with, having done this for about 15 years for KT. Um, as you can see, all of us have sat through RCA sessions in our careers, and there's a lot of people that sort of look like this, buttoned down, pompous, uh, typically the technical experts um, who feel like they already know the solution and are wondering why they are uh, involved in it. Uh, but as you can see that occasionally the meetings get pretty quiet and people fall asleep. And then you get other people that uh, everybody came in to do some sort of root cause analysis process, and what they end up following is the one, the guy that's in the dark suit. He's got the expert suit on, so they follow his process. What I'm going to try to do today is make sure that you find ways to manage those meetings as well as find ways to uh, manage the people within those meetings and get them to use the root cause analysis tools. The other piece that I'm going to work on um, is around human performance problems. That's as, as we work in the industries that we work in and as I work with various clients, that tends to be one of the top three issues that we have in there. So I'm going to talk about a, a model around root cause analysis for people problems. Um, and when you get into the root cause process, um, you know, I'm going to show you various tools that allow you to manage your people. And one of the things that we found at KT is that, uh, and this is an interesting statistic that we, we've actually discovered and learned that's pretty accurate around adults and learning, is that um, without immediate use of learning new root cause analysis tools or continuous use of root cause analysis tools that they have, those skill sets begin to decline by about 90% after 30 days. And that's a really bad factor. And what we're trying to do in KT and with the KT Kappa program that we run is make sure that the expectations set around the use of root cause analysis tools actually meet what you're expecting to have happen and actually exceed those particular pieces. Um, so before I get started, 
Uh, what I'd like to do is do a quick poll. Uh, there's a lot of root cause analysis tools out there in the world. Um, with myself and a couple colleagues, we pulled together a few. As you can see when you scroll down, there's brainstorming, five whys, fish bones, cause and effect, fault tree, uh, and they move on and on and on and on around uh, a number of different tools. And I apologize if one of your favorite tools is not in there, but why don't we take about 30 seconds and please click on as many of these tools as you use currently where you work. Okay, uh, looks like we're populating them pretty quickly. I know we have a lot of people out there. Give you a few more seconds to finish the population. Okay, why don't we go ahead and stop the poll? Um, looks like when we look at this, uh, five Ys, which is not surprising, I used almost my 90% of the people. Fish bones is up there. Um, cause and effect, and uh, FMEAs, agree with that, although I won't be covering FMEAs in this one, but I will be covering fish bones, five whys, uh, a little bit of cause and effect, brainstorming, I'll talk a little bit about. So the ones that people seem to gravitate the most towards are actually the same ones that I tend to use when I'm working with clients and I find my clients using. Um, so. What you find uh, from Kepner Trigo, and I'll drop into KT because that's how we call ourselves, uh, we have a program that's called KT Kappa, and it's been designed for root cause analysis in the manufacturing and quality space, especially for regulated industries. Uh, although it works in all kinds of industries, that's sort of where its uh, genesis was from. Starting in the middle, um, typically in our program, we do some sort of diagnostics with clients. And then if you move to the right with the arrows, uh, typically the diagnostics talk about process improvement around some, some areas. It can be workflows, can be SOPs, can be all kinds of things. Uh, there's an element of training. Uh, part of what we believe in is passing on skill sets to people so that they're capable of doing the work for themselves once we leave uh, the operations. And then over in the left-hand side, on the capital program, you've got change management, which is an integral part. Typically, when you're uh, introducing or changing how you do root cause analysis or improving how you do root cause analysis, it becomes a change management program, so there's an element of that. Uh, and the last one on the left, um, which is pretty important, is leadership alignment. Uh, we can do all the things to the right of that, but unless we have our leadership team and our leaders within the organization aligned and understanding the new tools and the new processes or the change in the processes, it's going to be very difficult to make all this work. So it's a fairly comprehensive program with about five different levers. Uh, it's been highly successful. It's built around our proprietary tools. This is what's kept us in business for about 55 years so far. Um, and we work in the manufacturing quality, IT service management. Uh, in areas like pharmaceuticals, energy, auto, and mining. Uh, and the five tools, uh, which are what the company was founded on, are problem analysis, which I'm going to talk a little bit about our process, uh, decision analysis, which is an easy process to choose a corrective action, potential problem analysis, which is a risk management process. Uh, but I look at it as a, it's a light FMEA process. Uh, then there's the bottom one, which is potential opportunity analysis, and that allows us to uh, take things that are working well and how do we capitalize on it. And then over on the left is situation appraisal, which is a good questioning process because if nothing else, as a, as a root cause analysis person, you've got to be really good at asking good, solid questions. Um, first, I'm actually going to work in two of these areas. I'm going to work in the training area, and I'm going to work in the process improvement area uh, today. So in the training piece, Take a look at, oh, there it is. Okay, just advanced. Um, I'm going to talk about three different, three or four different tools today. 
Um, the first one I talk about is going to be the five Y tools. Uh, it's a pretty simple tool. It's known throughout the world. As you can see in the poll, it's probably the most common tool. I think it was almost close to 90% of the people use that. Uh, it came from, when you look at it, it came from the uh, Toyota process. Um, oops, sorry. My slides are moving slowly, uh, which began in the 1970s. Uh, it was a Toyota production system. It's uh, used now industry-wide. And what Toyota found, and the reason they used it is they were trying to do troubleshooting activities. Uh, they did not discover root cause before actions were being taken, and sometimes the actions were actually causing more problems. So they stepped back and tried to find a way that everybody, line operators, all the way up through senior management, could address problems and keep them from reoccurring. So the way a quick review of the 5Y process works is that it is a series of questions. Five is the nomenclature that people fall to, but typically it can be less than that. In some cases, it can go longer than that. And what you end up finding is, uh, as an example, um, to, to, to quickly go through it, let's say you are uh, coming in on your shift, and you're actually right around now where I am in the Eastern time, you're probably moving into the start of the third shift. And when you come in on the third shift, um, you're told the line is not running. So you're automatically, by human nature and uh, the way you think as a troubleshooter, you're dropping into the 5Y process, and so you're asking, well, why is line running slow? Uh, and you might get an answer from somebody on the previous shift that uh, something general, they, well, the new widgets don't fit. And then you're going to ask, well, why don't the new widgets fit? And the response is going to be, hey, there's a hole that's too small. It's not allowing us for easy insertion. And you're on your third why, why is that hole too small? And then you're going to get an answer typically that is, that's the way it was specified in the drawings. And then you're going to ask, well, why do the drawings have those specs? And that question gets answered with, well, that's the data that's in our system. And why is that data that seems to be bad in our system? And you get the answer, well, it looks like it's entry error. Typically, when you get an object deviation type answer uh, or something like that, where you can start to take co or corrective actions on it, you fit root cause with five whys. It's a real simple process, as everybody understands. I think it gets used about 80% of the time in most of the basic process or basic problems that you have. The thing that we at KT and what I try to bring to clients is that once you get into that, it's entry error, as my example was, it's a process that we take one more step. It's like think beyond the fix. So we now know why we have this problem, and we're going to be able to fix that, but we'll ask where else in the operation might we potentially have this problem? Um, where else in the company do we use the same CAD system and the same or manufacturing the same things that maybe they haven't had the problem yet? Should we alert them about what we've had and what the uh, experience is and how we fixed it? So we're taking that additional step, which we call think beyond the fix, tends to add a little bit of, uh, it will actually adds a lot of value in thinking beyond just what the uh, five whys offer. Um, the other thing is, which happens, uh, you'll get to that fifth why or sixth why or whatever it is, and you still have a cause unknown problem. You don't know what happens there. For us, the way we look at it is this is a great problem statement. Um, and that problem statement is usually in a format that's an object defect format. Very, very simple problem statement. Everybody understands what it is, but now we've got to pro do some deeper dive, use some other root cause analysis tool to try to address it. And we've actually found with one of our clients, IBM, uh, that if they get a good solid problem statement, they've actually uh, statistically found they've improved their finding of cause by about 15 to 20 percent just by having that initial statement. Um, so five whys is a simple concept. Like I said, I think it's used about 80 percent of the time and gets uh, is an effective process. It addresses those issues. Everybody understands how it works. It takes very little training to make it happen. But then you get into what are you going to do about the tougher issues, which are the 20% problems. And those 20% problems, I'm going to give you three more techniques that I tend to gravitate to. Um, they're not the perfect techniques, they're, they're, but they're ones that are pretty common in the industry, and I find them very effective. The first one is the Ishikawa diagram, or excuse me, the Ishikawa process, which is 
uh, collectively known as fish bones. Um, that's generally where I would go to next. And the idea around the fish bones is that it's a standalone root cause analysis process. It can also be a feeder to other root cause analysis processes. In fact, when I talk about the KT is is not technique, uh, it is a feeder that we use for uh, identifying possible causes. The fish bones all describe uh, in a systematic way using six areas. It is uh, used by operators and troubleshooting teams, and it tends to get people to focus on areas versus people at this point in time. Uh, the diagram looks like this. I think everybody's familiar with it. A couple of points I want to make here on the fishbone diagram. Um, when we talk problem spec, and when you go back to look at these slides in problem spec, that is a specification that we develop a KT using an is, not, is, is, not template where we collect data. Uh, and that problem spec, which you'll see in a few minutes, can be something that you end up um, using to generate possible causes. Uh, also note that uh, sometimes I use process mapping here uh, to identify, to support my fishbone technique, uh, process mapping, which wasn't one of the root cause analysis tools that was listed up there. It's an excellent way to understand how the whole process works and show how the inputs and process steps relate to the output. Uh, these I've found that these interrelationships in these steps typically help people or the team then generate causes uh, or generate additional causes in the various fishbone areas of the diagram. Um, however, uh, you know, using process maps to gener generate the fishbone diagram can be a lengthy process. My experience is nine times out of ten when you start doing a fishbone on a problem uh, just by the idea of brainstorming or people's knowledge and experience, they're able to populate possible causes in the people machine uh, material areas as well as the ones along the bottom. Um, again, when we work with clients using fish bones, we work very hard to make sure that as they populate each area in the fish bone, they put in causal statements with an object deviation format. Uh, and the idea here is that sometimes you might put something on a fishbone that could be uh, broad and general enough that there's multiple causes in it. Um, and I'll give you uh, some examples later on when I show how fishboning fits into the KT process. But the, the idea is you want to make sure there are no gaps in the logic. So you want to end up with causal statements. You want to make sure that uh, sometimes there are too many possible causes once you start separating them out. So it may indicate that you need to go back to your problem specification and take a look at the data that's in there. It may not be as factual as you expected it to be. All right, um, moving along, those are two of the top ones that were in the poll, fish bones and five whys. Uh, the next one I'm going to describe is KT problem analysis. Uh, it's it's listed uh, in KT. We call it problem analysis, and the way our first step is a problem statement, which comes out of the five Y space, and you get that object deviation, and then we collect data uh, in a structured format called is is and is not. So I have lots and lots of clients that have toolboxes of root cause analysis methods, and in there it's usually listed as an is is not table. I also have clients that say, hey, we're going to KT this one. Uh, the full KT process, which I won't spend uh, a lot of time explaining, I find with clients typically gets on those 20 percenters. They've used five whys, uh, and if that's not successful, they probably move to a fishbone or a cause-effect situation. And if that's not successful, and that's usually those two or three techniques tend to get about 80 percent of the issues, they'll move into the more complex ones, and the KT is is not process is uh, one of the ones that fits that scenario. Um, what it really does is visually, as you can see in this, this PowerPoint slide, it visually lays out uh, the data that's been collected. Um, and we are very much into factual data. So on the left is literally, uh, I think this is out of an IT problem we were solving. Uh, on the left is typically uh, the way a lot of problems are described by people who are solving it or operators who first see it. It's sort of a stream of consciousness writing things down. 
they, they tend to get the good quality information, but we want what we want to do in KT is put it into a template and a format on the right side that's a lot easier for people to track and follow. So let me take a minute and explain that kind of template. All right, and you advance that slide for me. Thank you. Um, so it starts off with a problem statement. And again, that problem statement is very simple for us. It's an object a deviation or an object defect. As I said earlier, if you get to the end of five whys, you're usually in that format. And if you don't know cause, you can list that last why out and put it at the top of our template. Uh, we then begin to define the problem into four areas, which are fairly common to how people describe problems. It's what happened, where did it happen, when did it happen, and the extent is how bad is the problem, how many uh, products, how many widgets, whatever's happening with it, you know, how, how bad is it. And they can tell you on that is side in detail what's happening. When we ask and go to the is not side, which is a key part of our process and the is is not specification, people think this naturally and this is information that we collect and what it does is tighten up the is data in those four areas and literally the is not information is what you're going to use to eliminate possible causes and get down to what we call the most probable cause. Um, here's an example of that template uh, that's completely empty this time. Uh, and I'm not going to walk through populating this one. I'll do it on another one. But I want to try to give you a sense of uh, how it works and what the is and is not function works like. So one of the easy ways to think about what is nots are uh, is um, everybody tends to travel or even when you get home you tend to turn the TV on and right now um, if you're in the US there's a number of baseball games going on in the playoffs and actually last night I was in New York City so I came back after meetings turned on the TV to watch the game because it was a big game for New York City and uh, when you turn when I turned on the TV in the hotel room uh, went to the ESPN channel and the screen was entirely dark. There was no picture whatsoever. Automatically, um, your mind starts to think about what KT calls is nots. And so you start looking for is nots to begin to rule out possible causes. So in this simple example, um, I would end up, I ended up turning the channel, one channel to the right. So let's say I was on 13, I went to 14. Now, when 14 came on, there was a picture. Uh, it wasn't the ESPN game I wanted. It was another ESPN channel. But by seeing that was not the problem, that automatically for me, as an is not, ruled out a bunch of possible causes that had already started running through my head. Number one um, was the cable working in the room. Obviously, it is because channel 14 works. Uh, number two possible cause was the cable box to my TV working. Clearly, it is. Another thought I had was cable out for the entire hotel. Well, obviously it wasn't because the other channel showed me uh, that there was a TV picture. So by that simple mental exercise of looking for is nots, when I compare them to my ises, so my is was channel 13, the baseball game. Channel 14, the is not has a picture. It's closely related, and it tells me automatically that a bunch of possible causes make no sense given the data. So that's how the is's and is nots work. Uh, we lay them out by asking questions starting in the first row and work left to right. We'll go down to the second and left to right. And we end up populating the uh, entire table. Oh, it's not moving. Please advance it. Can somebody advance? Ah, thank you. Oop. Okay. So now I'm going to show you, using another example, how the table gets populated by going left to right through the columns. 
Now, this is an uh, investigation that we helped uh, in the uh, German market around automobile problems. So you have your problem statement, object defect, cars are crashing. Uh, they actually, I mean, it's, it's a real simple example, but it actually is very effective in showing you how this, how this whole table gets set up. Um, at that point in time, we weren't sure why the cars were crashing, so we decided to pull together a problem spec. So the first is it's cars. It is not semi-trucks or buses. Next one, it's they are crashing total loss uh, of each car. It is not broken down that car or a minor incident, just a fender better, excuse me, fender bender. Um, then we move into the wear areas. It's happening on the Autobahn and where specifically on the Autobahn, we would ask it's five kilometers stretch south of Cologne. Uh, it is not happening in other urban areas of the Autobahn, such as Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt, et cetera. Um, where is it happening on the car? Well, it's actually impacting the front, but then the damage is all over. It is not happening uh, any specific spot. So like uh, you maybe sideswipe some, side something and it's on only the right side or the left side, depending on which way you're traveling. When did it start? Early September. Uh, it wasn't seen before September. It's continuous. We see it all the time with cars in that section. Um, it is not periodic. It is during the night, which is a key piece of information. It's not during the day or at dawn or at dusk. And then we get into the extent information. It's, I mean, there are accidents all the time in the Autobahn in that particular stretch, but in this particular case, starting in September, it was about 2% above the average. Uh, it's a total loss on the car. It's not cosmetic or minor damage. Um, NMDs come up sometimes because you ask, and there are specific questions that we have uh, aligned to these four areas. There are times when you ask the specific question of the people that are involved, then they don't have an idea or they're not sure about the data. So we use the acronym NMD, need more data, as a space holder so that we know, hey, we don't have facts yet for that area. And the last extent question is, hey, it's stable. It's not increasing or decreasing. So in a real simple example, that's how we uh, would fill out an is is not table for cars that were crashing on the Autobahn uh, near Cologne. Then we would take the fishbone and either the fishbone hasn't resolved the possible cause or we've identified the fishbone as a way to generate possible causes. Either way works for us in KT. And in this particular example, I'm going to pick something out of the environment area of the fishbone. And the idea is here, uh, one of the possible causes is that it's black ice. So what we would do is test the possible cause of our cars are crashing is black ice against each of these pairs one at a time. And the concept is we want to take this factual information that we have right now and eliminate the possible cause, if any of the facts do, or write down assumptions uh, if they get through some of the facts or actually confirm that that is root cause. So in a quick example, it would, we would say if uh, black ice is the cars, the reason why our cars are crashing, how come it's <clears throat> only happening cars and not semi-trucks or buses? Uh, and you might get some answers like, well, you know, buses and semi-trucks, maybe the black ice isn't that thick, so they're able to manage their way through it. For us, that's an assumption. We document that, and then we go down to the next one. So if it's black ice, why does it <clears throat> cause a total crash, and it's not like a fender bender or a broken mirror or something like that? Well, that fact makes some sense with black ice because typically, when, <clears throat> excuse me, when you hit it, you tend to you know, lose control of your car, so that would allow you to have a total crash. Um, so that those two facts make sense. So if black ice is the cause of our cars crashing, <clears throat> how come it only happens on the Autobahn and not uh, anywhere else? And the, uh, excuse me, the five kilometers stretch of the Autobahn and Cologne and not anywhere else. Well, that pair of facts really makes it difficult for black ice to be our root cause or even a potential possible cause because when you step back and look at it, and we were working with people, there was black ice uh, in various spots of the Autobahn outside of Cologne, uh, beyond just a five kilometer stretch, there were black ice periods of time. Um, at the same period when we started in early September, 
and the other areas, yet none of those other areas or other areas around Cologne were showing any kind of or having this particular car crashing incident. So in our process, uh, black ice was ruled out as a possible cause. And then if you went back to your fishbone, we'd take another high, pop, high probability possible cause and run it through uh, the is is not specification. So in short, um, that is the is is not KT problem analysis. Um, oops, sorry. It is a nice way to collect factual data. It does not take a long time, as you saw. Um, and then the fourth tool that we use that, that I like to go to and gravitate to is another root cause analysis tool called 8D. Um, it's a common process that was, that is, was started in the automotive industry by Ford. It was actually something that KT uh, developed as well years and years ago. The reason that I really like it is that it's scalable. Um, you can introduce various root cause analysis techniques within the 8D process, and I'll show you a template in a little bit where we've done that. Um, you can also introduce in the 8D process human performance problem analysis. Uh, on the right-hand side are the steps in the 8D. Uh, there are eight steps, obviously. Uh, they're labeled as Ds, as you can see. Um, and most or, or half of the steps are around developing the understanding of the issue. And then the other half of the steps are around taking action. Um, can somebody advance it? Thank you. Uh, this is an example of an 8D template that uh, KT has pulled together that takes the steps that you saw, the 8D steps in the previous slide, lays them out on a single page. It's very visual. Uh, you can see that in this process uh, at the top is a problem statement. This is where we would introduce five whys. If at the end of the five why process you still haven't found cause and you want to go to the 8D root cause analysis process, <clears throat> right there we put the object defect 5Y. Uh, here are the fish bones. In this particular template, there are some suggestions on how to generate information for the fish bones. Um, again, you can either lift the fish bone process that I showed you earlier and lay it in here, or you can duplicate it. Here's the KT is is not specification laid out. This is where we collect our data. Um, so you can see that the three tools that I've talked about so far, <clears throat> excuse me, fit nicely in this. And then when you take a closer look at it, it's got a lot of other good visual information, which is why this one-page template makes is such a powerful thing. This particular area that the cursor's on, you can put pictures of the issue. Uh, this particular area down here, you're you're able to put in some process maps, some workflows. Over here, you're testing out your possible causes and able to show that, uh, you know, which causes were considered, which ones were ruled out and why. And then you move into containment actions and root cause analysis. And even down here is the idea, think beyond the fix. You found cause, you've contained it, you've done the corrective actions. You know, now you've done uh, a little bit of preventive action. Where else in the uh, plant might this work? So it's, it's a pretty slick template using the 8D process that's able to build in other root cause analysis techniques. And the last thing I'll say about it is that if you have other root cause analysis techniques that you are fond of or the company uses, uh, there is no problem switching some of these out. So you may switch out the fish bones to put in fault trees. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of this. You can almost plug and play with it. All right, so summarizing, um, I've talked about four different methods. They work well in a break-fix environment. Uh, around, around mechanical, chemical, or biological issues. Those are the typical ones that I work with when the type of clients that I uh, tend to see. Um, they help you fix problems faster. Um, people who are trained in them and use them often enough, remember that uh, they've got to use them a lot so they don't lose the uh, understanding of them. They'll end up um, feeling confident using them. So it's it's they're just nice, nice, solid tools. And again, from our analysis, um, or our, excuse me, our polling question, it looks like everybody tends to gravitate towards at least those three. Take a few minutes now to talk about human performance problems. 
Um, this is a model that KT uses. Uh, it's pretty simple, but it's very elegant. It basically starts with the assumption that the performer there in the middle comes to work with every intention of doing a good job that day. Um, and then something tends to happen, um, and there's a problem. And what we find is that, like I said earlier, uh, human performance issues, or what we call fondly call operator error issues, tend to, if you do a Pareto analysis of your uh, problems in the plant, you will find that they are usually in the top three issues. And typically, the very first solution is retrain that person. So if Michael's problem, uh, obviously he didn't understand the SOPs, or obviously he didn't follow some sort of step, but let's go ahead and retrain him. And what I'm finding, especially in regulated industries, is that a lot of the regulators now, when they go in and do audits, uh, and they see retraining, or they see problem people problem as, as a top issue, and they constantly see the solution as let's retrain people, they're basically coming back and saying, you really haven't found root cause. So this model is, a, is a, as I said, very simple but very elegant. It takes that concept that nobody's coming to work trying to do a bad job, and, and we'll try to figure out what the issues are that cause uh, people to have problems. Can you advance it, please? All right. Uh, again, KT is a data, factual type company. This is the model again. It's called a Sprickbid model, as you can see. Uh, and these are the questions that we tend to ask of the performer, which might be, in this case, the operator, uh, to try to understand why that operator or the team or that shift are having people problems. Uh, we'll look at the response that we're seeing, which is the R. We'll look at the consequences that are happening, encouraging or discouraging consequences uh, for those people or that operator. We'll take a look at the feedback that's happening, um, and we'll also look at the environment the situation that's around that performer. Um, uh, you know, is, is it conducive to performing that type of operation? This is a bit of analysis. Um, it's not difficult analysis to do for people problems. The questions are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you're asking the performer. You're asking people there. You're going out and observing the line to start to gather this data. And, and once you've gathered this data, you will end up moving into how to fix it, which is this process called balance of consequences. And the idea of balance of consequences is that you have a, basically the way I look at it is the performer on the left-hand side and what the desired response that you're trying to get out of that, that person or that team or that shift is up at the top. Um, and then down at the bottom is what you're trying to achieve. And then you use this tool to begin to find out what root cause is. Um, this tool actually easily identifies and demonstrates the nature of the consequences to the performer, uh, whether they're immediate or delayed, and the positive and negatives are encouraging consequences for positive and discouraging consequences on the negative side. Um, and you're laying out the information that you got when you collected that data on the previous slide in these blocks. Um, and then at the end, you want to consider the consequences to the organization, uh, as well as just the individual or teams, and so you lay those out as well. And then what happens is when you step back and start to take a look at this information, uh, you look at which consequences will exert the strongest influence on the behavior and those are the ones you want to start to drive towards for the people or the team with a shift so that uh, you start to eliminate your people problems. Um, it's a three-step, well, it's actually a two-step model, a little bit of data collection, which is the previous slide, and then taking that information and putting it into a set, uh, this uh, series of boxes called balance of consequences. Okay, um, I know there are a lot of other uh, people problem type issues, um, or excuse me, people problem processes, uh, Swiss cheese one is one I see quite a bit. Uh, all of them are pretty good. The whole concept around, in my opinion, the whole concept around performance issues is to make sure that they don't focus on just an individual. 
they tend to try to look at the situation and what that individual is exhibiting. Um, so after this, I'm moving into an element of coaching. So when you learn these techniques, five whys, fishbones, KT is, is not, even the human performance model, um, how do you get people to practice and use those in a safe environment? In, in the KT Kappa program, we have a new product called the SimLab. Uh, it's basically a Lego Mindstorm robot, which simulates a virtual manufacturing uh, workshop. And the participants are limited to data that uh, the instructor passes out to them. They start with easy problems. They're all in the manufacturing space. Uh, and as they get more confident in this safe, uh, easy to use environment, they become more complex problems. So they may move from using just a 5Y root cause analysis tool uh, into a fishbone diagram, and then they may move into a full-blown 8D root cause analysis. Um, the idea is that uh, people get to practice. It's very uh, hands-on. The, uh, the world is, I, I keep hearing the word called gamification, which tends to be where the industry is going in the training space. And it's just a nice little tool that's easy to use, pretty much driven by the instructor. People get roles. They get uh, different kinds of information. And they're able to practice things in a safe environment, which is great to have happen after training happens, before they go out to actually perform root cause analysis in the workshop excuse me, not in the workshop, in the plant. Um, it's a relatively, well, the industry is in the gamification now. This is something that we provide in our KT Kappa program. I have clients now that are using this particular tool to uh, identify, you know, what kind of training people need. I have other clients that use it as tabletop exercises even after training is over. Uh, by you know a couple months, and I actually have a couple one client in particular now that's using it as a way to lay out the SOPs for their uh, investigation teams and set up scenarios to make sure that the investigation team follows their SOPs for the uh, uh, aspect of um, how they they manage it. So let me get to the question slide. I want to take a break for a second. Can you get me to the, there we go. So I think we probably had some questions so far. Um, we do, Michael. Thanks. So we'll just take a short break here because we have such a large audience today and we wanted to get to a few questions and then we'll continue with the presentation. The first question is, what's the difference between fishbone and cause effect? Um, to me, the fishbone is, is more graphic, graphical. Um, it's, it's very visual. People can lay things out when I go into plants. Uh, it, it lends itself to being in a uh, shift change for a huddle. It lends itself on a wall. Um, cause and effect is, is very similar to it. Um, but I look at, in my mind, cause and effect is where I end up using timelines uh, which aren't bad to use with fish bones or anywhere else, but cause and effect tells me, okay, this is the something that causes, this is the effect I see. So th they're not rel radically different, but I, I tend to like the fish bone because of the visual aspect of it. Okay. Our next question is, how often do you find that you have done five whys on the wrong problem? Do you have a problem definition to assure that everyone has the same definition ahead of the five whys? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yes, I confess I've done five whys on the wrong problem. I've done other tools and techniques on the wrong problem. Um, if you go, if you can recall back to that slide where we had the KT methodologies that was that orb. So we had uh, problem analysis decision on the right hand side, and on the left hand side was situation appraisal. That questioning technique that we train people in is one of the aspects of it is designed to make sure we get down to the right problem and the right type of tool. So as we separate and clarify issues, we do these, this can be used in shift change meetings, this can be used at the shop floor by the operators. I'm actually going to be doing a situation appraisal for a senior leadership team 
uh, around their upcoming issues for calendar year 2018. But the steps in that process get you down to actionable items that you identify then are either problems or decisions. And then after that step, you identify who it is that you want to get involved and what tool you'll use. So with that as my starting point, even when I go into a place, somebody will tell me it's a, this is the problem. I will take a few minutes to do what we call SA or situation appraisal. Okay. And um, our last question right now is, as a retail marketing company, I deal with outsourced vendors. Do you have customers with this format that send your templates out to their vendors to populate? We do. Um, there's a bit of risk in that. Uh, and the risk is if that vendor doesn't understand the process and the template that you're sending to them. So a bit of education goes a long ways in that process. Um, I, I think it's actually really important because many of the issues that I see are called SOS, supplier of suppliers, you know, like your tier two, tier three vendors, um, the ones that made the parts for the supplier that you're buying that product for in the retail space. And if you just send out templates to them and ask them to populate it without a little bit of explanation or a little bit of education or even in some cases formal training, you may come back with, you may get back the information that is absolutely, uh, doesn't help you do anything. So it's a bit of time to educate people and you can do it quickly in a webinar in today's world. I mean, a lot of people have the supply chain that comes out of, uh, non-U.S. operations, so getting on a webinar real quick and walking them through, let's say, uh, KT is, is not, and explaining something like that goes a long ways. Okay. And, uh, Michael, we'll go back to your presentation now. Okay, great. Um, so the last place I'm going to finish out, because I have about uh, 10 minutes uh, before we get to the last Q&A, is around process improvement. And what I want to try to achieve here is what we found in KT to really make root cause analysis tools stick, you need to have a couple things that have to happen. One is coaching of people, and that's why the Sim Lab is, is a nice uh, modern way to do the coaching. You can actually coach people side by side, but a safe environment of coaching makes it a lot easier. The other piece that has to happen to make people use the root cause analysis tools, or, or at least trigger people to use the root cause analysis tools, is integrating the templates or templates into your workflows, SOPs, or business processes. So that's what I'm going to focus on uh, to finish this out. Um, again, mine's stuck. Could you advance it one, please? Uh, I'm going to go from simple to complex templates. This is a very simple template. Uh, it's actually very powerful because of its simplicity. Starts off with five whys. Uh, and again, these templates I find used all over the place. I find them posted on walls. I find them by the operators. I find them embedded in the SOPs. Uh, I find them as uh, uh, Word documents that are in software systems for quality investigations. But any way you can get those templates that help people use the uh, root cause analysis tools visible to them that automatically triggers them start doing that thinking, which is the way the brain operates. So we've got five whys at the top. Um, if you know what the cause is, you're going to go down the right-hand side, confirm true cause, uh, and make sure you've documented things. If you're unsure what the, the cause is, you're going down the left-hand side. You might use the KT is, is not problem specification uh, to get the data collected. And then you go into either fish boning or brainstorming or using your knowledge experience to generate possible causes and test those against that is, is not specification. That circles about around to you've got down, you've eliminated a bunch of possible causes. You're down to a few probable causes. You do a final test on those to confirm that that's root cause. Very simple flow chart, but very effective. <clears throat> Here's another flow chart, a little more complex. Uh, a lot more boxes, obviously. Uh, engineers love more boxes and love this kind of diagramming. But the nice thing about this flowchart is it's got the same process I described in the earlier flowchart over here, but we've now added in the people problem model, the KT human performance model over here on the right-hand side. So it gives somebody those steps in that process at the big high level so they can follow down and 
if it's not a brake fix mechanical issue, but they think it's a people problem, is quickly evident and they can move over to this side. Um, a next kind of process that we pull together, a next matrix that we pull together is what I call an issue escalation matrix. It's still what I would term, it's probably somewhere between simple and complex. Basically, it's a table that we develop with clients. It's usually around four levels from minor to major problems. Uh, it helps people apprise the problem level and begins to tell them what kinds of root cause analysis tools to use, what types of people they need to engage, how long they should have to fix something. Um, and this particular one is geared towards the pharmaceutical world because we've got regulatory impact, safety, uh, efficacy, and operational. These boxes over here, depending on what you manufacture and what industry in, we change these boxes out to help us build that kind of model. And it ends up in a escalation matrix looking something like this. So we typically break them out into four levels. So these are levels of complexity of the problem. These are the type of activities that you should be doing depending on how complex the problem is. This is maybe who you get involved. These are the KT tools that you might be using. These are any other root cause analysis tools. And this is the documentation that needs to be followed and filled out. So if we stay with level one, which is usually a short line stop, not a big deal. Um, you just gonna identify the problem. Uh, it's gonna be the operator or uh, in the life science world, it might be a lab technician that's having that issue. Um, you're going to use the KT tool, which is situation appraisal to identify the problems. You might go to your SOPs and policies for the additional tools, and this is what we're going to document. A little bit bigger issue, same process over here. So it's a little more complex than the flow charts, but the beauty of this is that in a single page, in a snapshot, people begin to understand, okay, I need to deal with what's considered a level two issue, this is what I have to do, this is who I involve, and this is the documentation I make, excuse me, I fill out. Um, and again, the same concept, but a much more complex table. Uh, you can see many, many more details, uh, same format, same layout, uh, but more definition, so there's less, there's more rigidity around what's a level one versus level two problem, and there's less ambiguity for people when they're trying to figure out where to go. And there are more additional root cause analysis techniques, way beyond the ones I've talked about, but they're all perfectly uh, acceptable at any one of these boxes, and the documentation gets uh, much, much uh, greater as the problems go. Um, last one I'll talk about is what it's actually come out of the IT industry. They tend to develop what are called playbooks. Um, in our IT practice in the company, we've moved it into the manufacturing side that I'm on, the OPEX side, and we're developing playbooks for our clients that combine flowcharts and various tools and techniques. So this is one we've developed for a life science client. Uh, it's hard to read, I realize that, but if you were able to dive down into it, you can see the human performance model here. Uh, you can see areas of the KT problem analysis process. So all the root cause analysis techniques that are part of this particular client's SOPs are baked into here. And then some other tools are laid out down here at the bottom uh, to help them with additional information. Um, so that was a real fast, let me back up one slide. That was very quick around templates. I don't want to minimize that. The idea is taking the tools uh, and root cause analysis techniques that you've decided to embrace and take templates and bake those into your workflows, put those into your SOPs, make sure they're part of your business processes. Because what happens is as people follow those processes, those templates become triggers for them to say, okay, I need to use five whys or I need to use fish bones. And those templates laid out help them mentally understand what they learned or what they might have done you know, previously and reinforces things. So integrating templates from your tools into your workflows is huge. It adds a ton, ton of value. 
Uh, finally, um, give you a quick case study. This is a telecommunications company. Um, they achieved their four times over improvement goal. Um, they identified a few root cause analysis tools. They developed some internal coaches that were operators that we supported them with that development around soft skills for coaching. Uh, they've added in some other tools. They made sure it was embedded into their processes. Uh, and they also decided to embrace the sim lab and use that for a safe environment to practice things. And what ends up happening is a, a ton of improvement. And it was way beyond what they expected. Uh, the training was reinforced. And the bottom line was they were able to exceed their improvement target by about 300%. And they delivered uh, in the telecommunications space 64% reduction in uh, MTTR, which is mean time to restore or resolve over a nine month period. So that's pretty substantial. Uh, it's, a it's a very recent case. And uh, it, again, it shows you the beauty of root cause analysis techniques combined with templates, combined with coaching. Um, okay, so I am being advanced to any final questions, anything there that uh, needs to be asked, Steve? Yeah, we've got a number of questions, um, so we're going to jump right into that. And while Michael's answering your questions, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that appears on the left-hand side of your screen. And with that, we will start with... Can the people problem process presented be used for individuals or groups of individuals? It can be used for both. Um, you know, you, it, it, it's typically people start to use that process on just individuals, but with a little bit of thinking, uh, you can use it on. I use it on shifts. Uh, we have a, play, a process called best demonstrated performance. So you might have sh one shift that's doing better than the other shifts in your operations and they you know they have a performance level that you want the others to obtain uh, attain so i would take the people problem and do it across a shift level and ask the same kind of questions okay another one yeah is it acceptable to put as an issue training people operators or is it a no identification route well studied I'm um, not sure I understand that, but let me take a crack at it. Okay. If Can you repeat it one more time? Sure. It says, is it acceptable to put as an issue training people operator, or is a no identification route well studied? So to me, if I understood it right, is, is the root cause operators and the solution is training people? Um, Again, I fall back to I don't think people intentionally try to create problems. Um, something's happening in that model that I used, uh, demonstrated, that's, that's impacting them to have that problem. So that's, that's where I gravitate to. I, I would rather find what's causing them to operate that way versus that's more training. Uh, that tends not to necessarily fix everything. And if you train the same person three times, then it's got to be something else. Yeah. How does KT measure the success of their training? In other words, what is the measurable that can be reported and tracked? Um, that's a great question. When we work with people in consulting engagements, uh, back in that KT Kappa model where we have the diagnostic piece, we'll sit down with the client and understand why they're looking at fixing their troubleshooting process or their operations or a particular area of their operations and their manufacturing. Uh, and then we'll try to understand what the metrics are that they're using that telling them they have those issues. And then in our analysis, uh, we'll come in and do some diagnostics, uh, take a look at the, whatever they're asking us to look at, confirming that their metrics are accurate, and then come back with uh, a proposal around, you know, based on what we've seen, here are a number of different projects that we can work with you together that will drive this metric in this direction. Uh, and typically, we're, we've been doing this long enough, we can give a pretty good idea of what that improvement in that metric might be. So we, we work in that training as a part of those engagements, and that capability transfer to people around a lot of different of our, our technologies and others 
is what helps move that metric. Okay. We're coming up on the top of the hour. We are going to go over a few minutes due to the size of our audience and the number of questions we've received. So um, please stick okay. with us. Any suggestions for sharing lessons learned between departments, companies, et cetera? Yeah. Um, yeah that, that, that's, that's got a lot of things in my head running. One is that think beyond the fix. If you make that a functional part of how you finish out your problem-solving process, the steps in there are all around where else in the, in the plant can we have this potentially happen. I mean, when we're in plants, you know, pump problems are huge. And you always know you've got uh, four of the same pumps working in different spots. They may be doing different functions. But if you have one that's giving you heartburn and you've solved the problem, you should automatically be thinking about, alerting the other areas of the plant to what you found. Um, same thing goes, and I, I see it a lot in the life science space, where it's plant to plant. So you'll have a sister plant manufacturing identical or very similar products. One might be in Puerto Rico and another might be in Ireland. And what happens is the plant in Puerto Rico has identified the root cause of something that's been systemic. And they've done a good job of expanding that think beyond the fix out into the, the plant itself. But what they need to be able to do is elevate that out and put out an alert to the rest of their company, uh, and specifically to that plant in Ireland that I gave as an example that's manufacturing the same thing about what they found. The way to do that, um, it's easy as an email, pick up the phone. More formally, the way to do that is through some sort of SOP or software system where they can access what you've done and be able to see the data and then apply that to their operation. Okay. What else? Um, our next question is, how do you get folks to think about beyond the fix that you mentioned rather than react to the situation or issue immediately? Um, it's two, 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 two things. One is simple and the other is a little more complex. A lot of the simple ways of doing that is just ask people to do that. Um, the, the reality is people want problems to be solved. They want their jobs to be uh, less complex. They want it to be easier. And, and the way to do that is to start doing think beyond the fix. Um, and the way to get them to start doing that is if you're in the management level, uh, you've got to remind them of that. Um, you've got to ask them to do that. You have to help them do that, talk to them through that. Then more formally, um, you can have it like we do in the 8D root cause analysis template where it's a formal step at the process. And again, that gets back to if I get a bunch of those templates back and that step, which I think is right at the very end, there's nothing in there. I know people aren't doing that. So now I'm going to go back out and walk the walk and start talking the talk. Uh, it, it's changing people's behavior is, as we all know, Challenging. That's why we have in the KT Kappa program a whole lever around change management. But really what it gets down to, and I was with a senior vice president up in Boston uh, two weeks ago who was big on change management, um, and he says that basically it's winning it over one person at a time for a, a period of time until it gets a hold and you move along. Hmm. Okay. Um, so we've looked at a number of tools in this webinar. Our next question is, how can I know what's the best tool to use? Um, a bit of that is what's, what's your culture comfortable with? Some industries, they're not comfortable with highly complex problem-solving tools. Um, other industries are. Uh, some operations, I think just about everybody has heard of five whys no matter what industry you're in. Um, so that's why it's a, my go-to basic tool. Uh, and it's easy to, for people to follow. And once you start showing people success and using a RCA methodology, they tend to want to learn more. And then you just have to step back, uh, you and the rest of your management team, and identify of all the root cause analysis tools out of the critical few. You don't want to bury people with, you know, six or ten because 
they're only going to use one or two. And you want to figure out what those one, two, or three tools are that you want them to continually use. And then we call that a common language. You pretty soon find people using those over and over and over, like in those meetings, those first few slides I have. You know, in mm-hmm. fact, I hear a lot when I go to clients, they, they'll tell me, hey, we're going to KT this one. And that's all they need to say. Everybody knows they're going to start with filling out that problem specification. The is, is not. Okay. Uh, our next question is, when solving problems, we're generally pushed to solve them as quickly as possible. We also want to have some metrics that we can use to measure the effectiveness of our problem-solving activities. So what are some effective metrics that encourage quick but effective problem-solving, but don't discourage people from reporting or adding more problems to the workload? Um, you know, it, that, that's, that's a hard one. And the first metric that jumps to my mind is that one I use in the case study, the MTVR. Um, and, and, it, and it's a pretty good metric. Uh, the amount when you go to the tables that I have, the issue escalation table, um, the more complex one, which had the yellow band and the red wording on the right hand side, it talks about levels and it talks about uh, you know five minute uh, shutdown or five minute line stop. This is what you do for level one, and those mm. kinds of Timing things help people understand how do I do things quickly? Um, how do I do things that are more complex or at a greater level? The other thing is quickly to think about is, you know, what are you reinforcing as management? There is a ton of pressure to fix things quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, you've, you've got to pick a few me- metrics, identify those, and find out what's driving those and build uh, momentum to make those work. Happy to talk to anybody about various metrics. Okay. Um, Have you had any experience with an apparent cause? Do we treat these investigations the same as a root cause? And what was the first apparent cause? Yeah. Have you had any experience with an apparent cause? I'm not certain what an apparent cause is. I'll take a stab at what I think it might mean. Um, when we work, there's you, you always have in, in shifts or meetings or whatever, uh, people who know what, what the cause is, because we saw that last week or we saw that last year. Um, and so if that's to you an apparent cause, I agree. And they tend to be the ones that people say, oh, yeah, we saw that last week. Um, we did this to fix it. Uh, Let's just do it again. And my position is, you know, you might be right, but let's stop and think for a second about that. Let's let's gather real fast a little bit of data and then take that cause through that data and make sure that it's really the root cause. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of times apparent causes come back because you haven't found the root cause. You haven't spent the time to get down to what's really the cause of the cause. Okay. And uh, I think uh just have time for one more question. That is, do you sure. utilize the fishbone to eliminate areas that do not address the problem? Ah, yes. Um, so you've got all those bones, um, and you will lay those out in a fishbone technique like we showed in the slides. You'll lay in possible causes in each one of those bones, and, and, and it will become pretty apparent that you're going to zero in on one area. So like in my example, when I was talking about cars are crashing, um, in this particular case, they were zeroing, zeroing in on the environmental area. And so rather than take all the possible causes and all of those other areas through some sort of process of elimination, we tend to focus on that area. That In this particular case, it was environment. And the the idea, and what actually happens is because of the technical people you have there and the SMEs and the people with, with the uh, tri- what's called tribal knowledge, they can zero in on which of those, those areas makes the most sense or in some cases they can zero in on a couple different possible causes from a, a couple different areas 
that seem to be likely, and then we run those through our is is not specification. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we've uh, run out of time. I'd like to thank our speaker, Michael Curran Hayes, and our sponsor, Kepner Trigo. As a reminder, if you're registered as a group, please add the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. On behalf of Industry Week, have a productive remainder of the day.